Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. 58 years ago today, the world awoke to the death of Marilyn Monroe. At her death, she was already one of the most well-known Americans of the 20th century. In death, she would become even more famous. Steeped in mythology and contradiction, she would become a symbol of her times. The lens of her own dysfunction gave her a unique perspective on post-war America. Ani East Nin once said that we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. This was truly how Marilyn saw the world. Looking at Marilyn today through the lens of our time tells us a lot about the place we came from and the world we now live in. We're going to talk about Marilyn today with my guest, Charles Casillo. He is the author of the novels The Fair Game and The Marilyn Diaries. His latest work is a comprehensive biography of Marilyn Monroe entitled Marilyn Monroe, The Private Life of a Public Icon. It is my pleasure to welcome Charles Casillo to the program. Charles, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be talking with you. It's great to have you here. Why are we still interested after all these years in Maryland? You know, through the years, so many writers and great thinkers have tried to describe what her appeal is, and there's really it doesn't lie in one thing. I think that all of her qualities um, come together to make this perfect cocktail, this concoction that's like an aphrodisiac. Her vulnerability, which we don't see that much anymore of, um, her physical beauty, her wit, her charm, it just it just mixed together and made the perfect combination that, you know, like Cleopatra through the ages, we still want to know more about her and discover the secret of her. It seems so incongruous looking deeply into Marilyn as, as you do in this era of, of Me Too and feminism and, and, and really where we are at this point in the 21st century. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's one thing about her. People seem to judge her or think of her in contemporary times, and it's when you when you are thinking of Marilyn, you have to put her in mid-century um, of last century, and um, the things that were going on. I mean, the casting couch was a very big part of uh, an actress in those days making it, getting their foot in the door. Um, it wasn't just Marilyn. People judge her because they say she used men. Um, everyone, all women in those days, and the male-dominated Hollywood, had to, in one way or another, catch the eyes of the men and please the men. One of the things that, that you talk about, and obviously it's been, been written about a lot with respect to Marilyn, is, is really the lasting impact of a very tortured childhood. Absolutely. Um, it, it really formed her personality, and it, was, and it was an important ingredient in her appeal, too. She never knew her father, which was a very big factor in her pain. Her mother was mentally ill. She grew up in the foster care system of Los Angeles and also the orphanages. And um, it, just, it, it just left her wanting to be loved, and that was a part of her appeal. I mean, with her sexuality, which was very blatant in the day and very shocking to some people, she also had this little please like me quality, this sensitivity that was, you know, it, it made it more palpable for her to be openly sensual. It's so interesting that she winds up, I mean, she grew up there, but that she winds up in Hollywood, which in some ways was both the best place for her and the worst place for her. You know, growing up in Los Angeles, Marilyn came to realize that in the day, one way that a woman could be accepted, loved, and also move high up on the ladder is her physical allure and beauty. And when, once she discovered she had that, Hollywood was really the one place where she could make it to the top, you know, with very little formal education, not have, being born into a family of connections or anything like that. She had to rely on her sex appeal and her beauty. And in those days, Hollywood was the factory for that. What did she understand about the dangers of Hollywood, having some sense of, of who she was and what her weaknesses were? I think one of the things that she realized was um, aging, uh, how that would affect her career. She worried about aging because so much in Hollywood was um, the foundation of it, you know, was beauty. And when she was just starting to make it, they were pushing away Betty Grable, who had been the previous sex goddess, you know, queen of the movies. And she saw that, you know, when she reached a certain age, they were going to push her away. How disposable the women were, I think, was the thing that she saw as a big um, pitfall of being in Hollywood at that day and that time. And how did that feed into her broader insecurities? 
Well, you know, um, when you realize at an early age that people are going to love you for one thing, and for her it was her physicality, her beauty, the fear of losing that, when you spend your whole childhood not being wanted, not being loved, not being accepted, and then you turn into a teenager and everyone wants to know you and be near you, and then you become a Hollywood star and people um, raise you to a level that you never dreamed of, the fear of losing that, the fear of... You know, and Marilyn's image was so peaches and cream. It was there was an innocence and a lot of childlike qualities in her. So that wouldn't weather time well. Like, say, someone like Marlena Dietrich, she could mature. She could be a forty-year-old, um, attractive, sensual woman. Marilyn's image wouldn't allow that. So that's why she was always trying to change her image and, you know, broaden her how the people saw her of the day. Talk a little bit about what she understood about that image, that, that she had that innocence, that naif-like quality covered with this sexuality that was so much a part of who she was? Well, she was very shrewd um, in her image, and she knew that, for example, when her nude calendar in the early 1950s, she had posed for it before she was famous, um, and when it was discovered that it was her on the calendar after she had become a star, there was a huge uproar in Hollywood and that this was going to destroy her and that her career was over. But she, instead of denying it, which the studio begged her to do, she just approached it with a childlike humor. Um, when she said, of course I posed. I was hungry. you know. And then when they said, well, what did you have on? She said, I had on the radio. Hey. They were very confused and beguiled by this kind of like innocence with this image of being a decadent woman. How much self-awareness did she have, and, and was it consistent, or did she lose some of it over time? Well, it's complicated, because she had a good self-image, but she wanted to broaden what she felt she had inside of her, which was being a great actress, which was being an intelligent person, which was even being, you know, um, forming her own company and, and producing her own films. But the, it was the times that limited her. I mean, once she established herself as one thing, in those days, it was really difficult to say, now look at me in this way. Now you see me this way. Now look at me that way. I mean, she used her physicality as a hook in the beginning of her career to get people's attention. But it was so potent that they didn't want to see anything else about her. And that was her big struggle throughout her short life. It's interesting how her strengths in so many cases, the things that, that really made her, are really the things that were also responsible for a lot of her undoing. Absolutely. I mean, we talked in the beginning of the conversation about you know why she endures. A lot of it is those um, contrasting personality traits, uh, the mystery on top of the mystery, the diversity in her. I mean, anyone who loves Marilyn relates to a different aspect of her personality and her career. It's, it's, you know, she, she's just an enigma. Um, one of her directors, um, Billy Wilder, said, she's a puzzle without a solution. Talk about her mental illness. What, what was her situation? Was she bipolar? And, and to what extent did she have any of that ever under control? Well, because of what was about, she was bipolar. Um, a doctor who had treated her in the last two years of her life said many years after her death that we know, the, the, the quote is, we know now that she was manic depressive, which we call bipolar, but he felt that manic depressive was a better description of what she was. They, they didn't have the treatment then that we, that we have today, and they didn't have the awareness. So what they did is they, they tranquilized her manic side, which gave her insomnia, and um, caused her to make rash decisions, but they really didn't know how to deal with the depression. So like many people in the day, many stars in the day, she self-medicated with alcohol, uh, she abused drugs. Um, so, you know, but uh, on top of the, the manic depression that she had throughout her career, she, her, you know, mental illness was in her family. Her mother was diagnosed as a schizophrenic. We don't know if Marilyn was, there's no formal, um, declaration that she was but she definitely you know had had periods in her life when she was unable to work when she was really unable to leave the cocoon like atmosphere of her bedroom uh she knew it was expected of her she knew how people would be looking at her she knew um that she had this image to live up to and sometimes she just her own personal self wasn't up to projecting that and yet there were other times where she was a complete workaholic when she was in, in these manic phases it seemed that 
she wanted to work all the time. Yes, I mean, she and her ambitions um, to work all the time and to become better, you know, studying acting in New York City with Lee Strasberg and wanting to do theater. Um, and, you know, it, it, that, was, that was part of her diversity. I mean, it was like she talked all the time about what she wanted to do and how important her career was. And she'd do a movie and the directors were enchanted with her because she was working so well and she was exceeding their expectations. Then she would disappear for two weeks and not be able to show up. It maddened the actors, it maddened the crew, and it extended the budgets of the films. But ultimately, usually it was worthwhile because it would bring in so much money in the end. Talk a little bit about her husband's, her relationships, and, and the way in which that those relationships affected her in different ways. Well, the thread of her important relationships is her wanting a father. When she was a little girl, her mother would show her, on, on the rare times that they were together, because her mother was usually separated from her because of her illness, um, she would show her a photo of a man wearing a fedora, a very handsome man, and say, this is your father. And Marilyn came to see him as someone who could take her away from her unhappy childhood and make things right, you know, as we look to her father for that. Um, When she did try to, in adulthood, when she did try to contact him, he didn't want anything to do with her. He said, contact my lawyer. So in many of the men that she became involved with, seriously, they were older men, um, and they had um, an air of being someone who could protect that little girl inside of her. That's what she was really looking for with, say, Joe DiMaggio, who was the sports hero of the world and had a lot of power in that um, arena. And then it was Arthur Miller, who was you know, the great playwright of the day and the great intellectual. He, she came to see him as someone who could protect her from the jokes that were about her at the time and the jeers and the laughs about her wanting to be too serious and take herself seriously. So she was really looking a lot of the time subconsciously perhaps, but for someone who would protect her, a protector. And did she ever find that, really? No, she didn't. She was still looking in the last months of her life when, you know, we talk about her entanglements with the Kennedy brothers. That really was the big attraction for her. Marilyn um, always saw her self-worth through the eyes of the men she could attract. That's sad, but it really is true um, from what we know about her. And at a very, very, very vulnerable stage in her life, when she passed the age of 35, and the newspapers were starting to say that her career was over, she sought out the most powerful men in the world, and they took notice of her. I think that she put more stock in what could happen. I mean, for, for them, particularly JFK, she was the, the grand prize of um, erotica in the day. You know, Marilyn Monroe was the sex goddess, and he as we know now, you know, love to play the field and put another notch in his belt, and he saw Marilyn as the greatest notch. She saw him as salvation. And then when that didn't pan out, she saw his brother as salvation, Robert Kennedy. Talk about the last couple of years of her life. It was a downward spiral um, professionally, and it was a downward spiral personally for her. I think it was a lot had to do with what we talked about earlier in the conversation about her fear of aging. Um, she passed 30, then she passed 32, and all the media coverage, which had always been, oh, she's the hottest thing in Hollywood, um, isn't she delicious, isn't she, started to say, how much longer could she go on? What's going to happen to Marilyn now? I think it panicked her, the fear of losing her power, her desirability, um, and uh, as a result, she was showing up less and less on the sets of her films. They were going more and more over budget. For example, her last film, The Misfits, with Clark Gable, it just went on they were filming in nevada in the desert a lot of the film took place there and the crew and the other actors were waiting in the desert in above 110 degree weather and she just wasn't showing up and a lot of times when she did show up she wasn't able to work because she was still under the influences of the sleeping pills that she had taken the night before in order to get some sleep and it was just a nightmare and then that was 60 1960 she didn't work at all in 61 because of her hospitalizations and her illnesses and her personal life and when she started her last film in 62 she only filmed i think you know a few days in uh, in the first months and they she ultimately got fired from that film did she have genuine protectors anyone that really cared about her in those final years no 
It's sad. I, you know, I wish that I could go back there and protect her. I think that's part of our appeal. <laughs> uh, a lot of us want to be able to go in a time machine and let her know that, you know, we can't really care. I think that people, some people, like the Strasbergs, did have good intentions in the beginning, but then her fame was so incredible that it was seducing and they wanted more and more part of that aspect of it. And they, I think she ultimately wound up getting used by people. They wanted more of her fame. They wanted more of her money. They wanted more control of her, and she was susceptible because she was, like I said, was looking for her saviors, and she found, she looked for it in her teachers, she looked for it in her doctors, and um, the, the the contrast in her was so compelling. The little girl lost, the big sex queen, the the Hollywood icon, the the businesswoman, and people just got caught up in that. Her doctors too. I think her last doctor started out with intentions of helping her, but I think he fell under her spell and um, wound up doing more damage than good for her. She was also so vulnerable and so fragile during that period. Yes, yes. During her whole life, but especially in those last years, she had all these different fears. I mean, she, was, she had spent 1961. Um, she spent some time in a, a mental institution in a straitjacket. She was afraid of ending up like her mother and her grandmother before her, um, uh, institutionalized. She was afraid of losing her power because of moving into middle age. Um, she felt her magic was leaving her. It really wasn't. We can see from the photos and the footage of her in the, la in the last year that it was transitioning to a new image. And had she been more, had she been, uh, you know, more mentally stable and a little bit more self-confident, she could have transitioned that image. Um, but she just didn't have, at, at that time, she just didn't have the wherewithal to um, change her image, uh, to, to move on with the time. She wanted, instead of um, seeing herself as a, a lovely, mature woman, she wanted things to stay as they were. It's interesting that everything she was afraid of, she precipitated to make happen. Isn't that true of some people? Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, the mind, you know, they say about the mind yeah. how powerful it is. It's like, you know, it, it wasn't so much intuition as it was bringing her fears to reality sometimes. Um, she thought people would use her, so they ended up using her. You know, she was very paranoid about being used. She, she thought that um, men would leave her, and they ended up leaving her because she put such demands, you know, partially because she put such demands on people. It was like she did regress to being a little girl, and she wanted... Un, unwavering devotion, you know, it, it was it was difficult. I mean, it was really, really difficult, I think, to know Marilyn Monroe. Like I said, we want to protect her, and we all feel that if, she only, if only I knew her, if only I was in her life, I could be the one. But who knows what those demands would have done to us. What surprised you the most that you found out about her? I was surprised at how dark her life really was. I mean, we all know that she was sad. It's part of her appeal. But I would have to say she was almost continuously in despair. She did have moments of happiness, days uh, here and there. Uh, she said that, you know, when she really hit the nail on the head in her work, when she did a scene that she felt she really um, nailed, that was like moments of happiness. But for the most part, she was such an unhappy woman, and people don't want to know that because she gave off such light. You know, if you watch Gentleman for Blonde, she's so fun and so happy and so delightful. You don't want to think about the darkness that was going on behind her. Which I suppose speaks to her skill as an actress in so many ways. Absolutely. Um, you know, and it wasn't really that appreciated in its day, but it's hard to imagine the best actresses that we know giving a better performance in the scripts that she had to work with, like Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, like Some Like It Hot, like The Prince and the Showgirl. They were dumb blondes, so people, you know, it's part, again, it's part of her acting skill. She was playing dumb blondes, so they figured, she played them so well and so delectably that people said she must be that in real life, which she was, she was nothing like that. When you talk about Marilyn, when you talk about this book, how do young people respond to it? What do they know about her? What have you found? I found that Marilyn is like a siren, like the Lorelei who calls to people. And even if they don't know anything about her, just a brief snippet from one of her films or interviews or a photo captures them. I mean, you see these kids with her poster hanging up on their dorm room walls 
or tattooed on their arm, and they don't know that much about her life, but her image calls to them. I, you know, when I was a kid, Marilyn died before I was born. When I was 11, I saw a photo of her in a, a photo of her in a magazine, and that photo called to me. And I've been spending the rest of my life so far trying to find her. And I thought at the time I was the only one who felt that way. You know, I was a, a, a boy in Queens, New York, a tough neighborhood. But through the years, I found out that that's not an unusual story. People of all ages from all over and from different backgrounds saw a photo or caught a glimpse of her on television, and they got caught up in her magic. Charles Casillo, his book is Marilyn Monroe, The Private Life of a Public Icon. Charles, I thank you so much for spending some time with us. It was a great pleasure. Thank you.